happy to welcome you all. I am uh, ready to get started. I think this is great. It's my summertime treat. Okay. When your names show up here, they don't always show up in order. Ah, Jocelyn, good to see you. Okay, great. Um, I'm B. Ruby Rich. I'm the editor of Film Quarterly, and I'm here to welcome you to our quarterly, as it happens, uh, page views conversations, uh, which we do um, on our webinar series uh, with every issue of Film Quarterly. So um, you hopefully have the new issue if you subscribe. And if you don't, don't worry, you can see the page views column online. Um, and you will eventually be able to see this conversation online as well and share it. And there is also a chapter from the book uh, free as a PDF download online. So this is Film Quarterly's commitment uh, to the literature in our field. And I'm really happy today to be welcoming uh, Lindsay Green Sims, the, the author of today's book on queer African cinema and Bruno Guarana, um, who is the editor of Page Views and who conducts the interviews that we publish and chooses the books and also is here uh, to have this conversation with Lindsay. Lindsay's joining us from American University and Bruno from uh, Boston University. And uh, I'm joining you from San Francisco as a, a proud uh, Professor Emerita of uh, UC Santa Cruz. So let me not hog the camera. And I want to welcome on board uh, Lindsay and Bruno for this conversation. Thank Bruno, you, Bruno. Lindsay, hello. Yes. Hi. Um, uh, thank you, for Lindsay, as well, for joining us today. Um, and welcome, everybody. And so today we'll be talking about Lindsay's new book, uh, Queer African Cinemas, um, which is a, a really exciting read. Um, and it, just by way of introducing it a little bit to all of you, um, it describes and analyzes how queerness in the form of queer characters, as well as in the form of queer narratives, appear and circulates in fiction films produced in the African continent, where state-sanctioned homophobia remains the norm. Um, so it ranges across different nations and uh, the films that Lindsay analyzes fit into two broad categories um, that I wanted to sort of highlight here. The first category comprises of what she calls international art films made in Africa. And those offer a more critical stance against homophobia and their circulation because they refuse to condemn queerness is often limited or blocked across the African continent. And the second category are those are the more popular melodramas that even though they feature a variety of queer characters, they function mostly as cautionary tales against queer practices. So you have two very distinct um, forms of representation here that, that she addresses in the book. Um, and for her, even though these films adopt very different approaches to representation, they enable, though sometimes in surprising ways, queer pleasure, and they teach specific forms of queer resistance. Um, and in fact, it's the, the rubric of resistance um, in its many expressions in the films that to Lindsay times them, ties them together and allows them to fit within the umbrella of queer cinema. So in searching for these queer representations, she also addresses different industry practices across African nations that include more established, more established industries such as Nigeria and South Africa, as well as films produced by nonprofit organizations in their fight for homo against homophobia. Um, and just before we get started into our uh, conversation, I wanted to highlight the, the contributions that queer African cinemas offers to different fields of study. Um, and it's interesting that it sort of circulates um, in three different areas. So to film studies, um, I see that the book breaks grounds, not just in its focus on African film production, but in its, in its depiction of queerness, how it's articulated and how it manages or sometimes doesn't manage to circulate across the continent. And, and this has methodological implications as well, because as Lindsay shows, um, there's, it's really important to assess reception as a key site for queerness. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, film festivals and even her field work in, in Africa and how that allows her to assess the idea of reception, how these films are received and circulated, um, sometimes extra officially or non-commercially. Um, to African studies, the book's focus on queerness helps uncover queer practices that 
queer practices that involve watching films, as well as participating as filmmakers and as audience members in a film festival, for example. And in that, the book also maps out discursive practices surrounding queerness at the turn of the century, which happens to be when African nations became more openly homophobic and in which resistance to homophobia also became more visible than ever before. And then finally, within queer studies, I see African, queer African cinemas as working to decenter queerness from the global north and to challenge common understandings of acceptable means of resistance, affect, and representation. Um, doing so, the book also offers a bold justification for a queer film corpus that includes not just films made by non-queer filmmakers, but also films made with the intention to condemn queerness. So we'll definitely talk about how that how that is that films that you know are designed to condemn queerness can be in many ways celebrated for allowing queer pleasure, right, and allowing queer resistance to come through. Um, so I wanted to actually start by thanking Lindsay for being here and for sharing this wonderful <laughs> research with us, um, but also with a question that I think is a little bit unconventional. Um, as I was looking through the book again this week, um, I was very moved by your uh, dedication page. Mm -hmm. And I want to start there because you dedicate the book to, and I'll quote this, to those for whom queer African cinema is life-saving. And I think that really gives, um, illustrates the importance, not just of the book, right? Not just of highlighting um, these films that are often, that often fall outside of different canons and different film classes and film history books, um, but also of the practices that these films enable. So, you know, I wanted to give it a chance to, to address that. Wow, what a great what a great opening question. So first of all, thank you, Bruno, for um, for that great synopsis of the book and its various interventions, also for the synopsis that you did, the review that you did uh, in Film Quarterly, thanks to Ruby and the entire uh, team at Film Quarterly. So. Uh, yeah, wow, that's a really great opening question, and I and I love it for so many reasons because I, well, I'll tell you where the the phrase came from. Uh, it came from, and and I quote it later in chapter four. But there's a a, a review of the film Rafiki, a podcast review in the podcast uh, Afro Queer, which is a great podcast. It's out of Nairobi, but it's really they they do stuff across the continent. Uh, and the one of the producers, Ida Halinambi, was talking about what it was like to see a queer Kenyan film in a Kenyan cinema. And there's a whole backstory to that as well. And she said, it felt like going to church. It felt life-saving. Right. And, uh, and I loved that. And I loved uh, that, that image for, for, for so many reasons of thinking of one, comparing it to going to church, especially given the complexities of Pentecostalism, but that a film could be life-saving and that it could have such a strong impact on people. And that's one thing that I found a lot in my research. I tried to analyze the films. I'm a film scholar, I'm a post-colonialist. I like to get into the close readings of the films, but I also really wanted to think about how they were resonating on the continent. And films like Rafiki um, and, and several others, I think mean so much to people uh, on the continent to see themselves, to see them represented, themselves represented. And also I talk about this in a couple chapters, but to think about films as conversation starters. So they're not the end of the conversation, but they're what enables, I mean, I, talk, I met more than one person who said this film enabled me to come out to somebody. And, uh, and I think that's really important not to put a premium on coming out as the end all be all, but I think that, these, that a lot of the films mean a lot to the, to the people watching them. And I wanted to honor that in the book and to think about their reception as well. Yeah, um, and you mentioned Rafiki, which illustrates the cover of your book, um, but it's just one of many films that you analyze. Um, but why don't we start with that? Um, because it has such an interesting history and in your, in your anecdote, it was about watching Rafiki in the cinemas, which of course didn't last for long. Um, right. So what happened to Rafiki? What is this film? So uh, it's an adaptation of a short story of uh, Jambula Tree by Monica Rakhtinyako. And it was, uh, it took when the director, Wanyere Kaku, 
a lot of time to, to source funding and to put it together. And the interesting thing is when she began the project, uh, she was really not thinking of it as a, as, I mean, obviously she was thinking it as a queer story, but she wasn't really thinking about it as a political story. She was looking for African love stories to adapt, to, to make an adaptation of. And when she read Jambula Tree, this is what she told me in, a, in an interview, that to her, it, it hit the notes that she wanted to. It was about young love and potential and hope. And it happened to be queer, but that wasn't necessarily what she was looking at, looking for. So, um, so I, I like that aspect of it, that it's supposed to be, and, it, and then it snowballed into something else. So she makes the film, she gathers the funding. Uh, there's a lot of procedures in Kenya. Each country has a different set of procedures in Kenya. You have got to um, you've got to submit the script beforehand, you've got to get approval, you've got to have police on set when you're filming. There's a, a, so there was the film, there was another film that I opened the book with Stories of Our Lives, uh, which didn't do these things in part because of its own backstory, because it was a little bit more, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a planned film, it, it kind of came a film because they were doing vignettes. Uh, and it got banned. And so one of the things that that Kahi was doing was looking at the lessons to be learned from what happened to stories of our lives and really hoping that that her film Rafiki wouldn't have the same fate. And actually, even the title Rafiki, they weren't calling it Jambula Tree at first because they wanted they didn't want it to, to point directly to the short story. And so it started out, she said it started out as a little bit of a, of a joke. Rafiki means friend. Um, so this idea that you have to, you know, you have to, you call your, your girlfriend a friend and, and, and to sort of, you know, mask the true nature of the relationship. So they were, they were trying to, you know, they were trying to both keep it, you know, keep it under wraps and also play by the rules. Uh, she really did expect for it to be able to be screened in Kenya. And what happened was the film got accepted to Cannes and Ziko Matua, the head of the Kenyan Film Classification Board, goes on the radio the next day and was like, We've got a film at Khan. We're so pumped. This is great. Um, you know, go Kenya. And then a couple of days later, he's like, by the way, it's banned. <laughs> so it kind of was like a little bit of whiplash, uh, getting accepted to Khan, getting banned, like pretty much, you know, a couple of days later. And so he banned the film. The, you know, it, it's not allowed to be shown. Um, on Kenyan TV, Kenyan, inter, you know, inter, internet, uh, like right now it plays, um, I don't know if it right now, but at one point it was playing on the, um, on South Africa, the DSTV, um, but it was like still blocked in Kenya. So, uh, so she winds up suing the government um, to say, this is, this is, uh, you know, you're, you're impinging on freedom of, of expression. And she winds up suing the government and she also wants the film to be eligible to be submitted to the Oscars, uh, which, and I didn't know this, but so apparently a film has to show in its country of origin for seven right. days in That's order right. to be eligible for, for the Oscars. And uh, so a judge, uh, a judge decided that it could show for seven days, just those <laughs> seven days, and then it would be re-banned. So a bit of a mixed bag, right? Um, yes, it got to show, and this is, this is, the context for the podcast where uh, Ida Halinambi, you know, says that it was, it was just this magical moment because the theaters were like inundated with viewers and it wasn't just queer viewers, you know, and it was, you know, and yes, there were some people that were just, you know, kind of curious, but uh, the theaters were packed. They were sold out in, you know, several cities across the country. Uh, it's the second highest grossing Kenyan film ever. It was just, you know, you they created, <laughs> very Bukodian, right? Like they created this event. They created, <laughs> I mean, it was on Trevor Noah was talking about it. Like they created this big thing, right? And, uh, and, and so that's the backstory. And then it was rebanned after the seven days. So if you, if you missed it in those seven days, uh, you couldn't see it. So there's that's a lot, the there's case. a lot more to be said about that, but wow. yeah, right. the, the backstory yeah. is yeah. quite, it's is quite interesting. And you mentioned uh, Story of Our Lives, which I know Ruby really mm -hmm. likes, but that's probably one of the most famous queer African films out there. Um, and I believe it's from Nigeria, right? Um, Ken it's also Kenyan. It's also Kenyan. <laughs> oh, the Ness Collective. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about that as well, about uh, a, non a non profit making a film um, mm -hmm. and then how the film came into being. Yeah. Sort of yeah. Accidentally and I'm, well. I'm going to pop in just to mm -hmm. say that it's the most famous unknown. Kenyan film because in the United States, mostly people have never heard of it. 
And when I've shown it at different places, people go crazy saying, what is this film? Why did I never hear of it? Because it's yeah. so exquisite. So I just, whereas Rafiki, yeah. thanks to Khan, and it's not right. often that we thank Khan for this kind of a selection, <laughs> but thanks to Khan, uh, Rafiki is known and yeah. was able to get distribution. Yeah. So back over to you, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, no, so, um, the stories of our lives is it's almost uh, it's almost the inverse. It was um, so the Nest Collective is an artist collective out of Nairobi, and they started out. They made a book, uh, and they traveled the country and collected stories from from people. And it's a it's a thick book, and luckily not banned. Uh, and so they made a book just collecting stories it's about queer life across the country. And the they decided to I think they turned one or two. They just using like a basic. Um, black and white camera they turned one one or two into like a 10 minute vignette in order to show uh, the the people the communities that they had they had filmed to uh, they had spoken to so it wasn't ever intended to go anywhere and the story that uh, that that Jim Chuchu the director who's listed as the director but I think there was it was very collectively made uh, that he told me was that the uh, the director of the Toronto Film Festival was in Nairobi visiting the Nest, Nest Collective and I was like oh what are you working on and they showed her this this one short that they had and she's like please make more and so they did and it was like you know scheduled to show at the film festival before they they had even made it um, and so they then they made uh, I'm not sure which was the one that they had already had or if that was even the one, but they wound up making five. And at first they, their names weren't even on it when they were in, in Toronto. So it, it took them a while to become comfortable uh, with it. And then they, the, one of the producers uh, got arrested for filming without a permit. Uh, they had done it really haphazardly and uh, was released. It was sort of a conditional release so we'll, your film is banned. And if you upload it illegally or distribute, you know, distribute it illegally, uh, you're, you know, we'll, we'll arrest you basically. So that's part of why, and it, it, it filmed, I actually saw it here, I'm in DC. I saw it at a film festival in Washington, DC. That's where I saw it. It's one of the moments where I realized that I could actually write a, a whole book on queer African mm -hmm. cinema. And I started and, at Toronto, so that's fascinating. Oh, at it. that, at the, yep, the it's very, right. it's premiere. So yeah, and so I, I, I mean, they, they kind of told me that they came back from Toronto and they're like, I guess we have to tell our parents that we made this film. And I think <laughs> on their way there, they weren't even sure um, to what extent they were going to put their names on it or whose names were going to go on it. So um, that's cool. You got to, you got to be there for a pretty momentous I, event. Yeah, really But it wonderful. hasn't. It I kept waiting then for it to yeah. start emerging circulating and it never yeah. did. And I thank yeah. you so much for the story because I never knew what happened yeah. uh, till your book and this conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's got a distributor, but it's not, it's a it's a, um, it's a South African distributor. So I, I mean, I had my university library order a copy, which is probably what you did as well, if you're showing it. But um, what's interesting is that um, they were talking about, you know, they could, Jim Chuju was saying like, I could, you know, it could be uploaded illegally, like, right, that could happen. But one interesting comment that he made was that he really didn't, he didn't, what did he say? He said, I don't want people to feel like watching queer African films or watching mm -hmm. a queer Kenyan films is something illicit. So I'd actually rather, you know, I'd rather it sort of not exist than it exist as this mm -hmm. sort of illicit mm -hmm. thing. And I thought that was interesting because mm -hmm. obviously it wouldn't be hard to, leak part of it. I mean, they were not made, they didn't make it for profit. So it wouldn't be hard to upload part of it, but I think there's been a conscious effort to not do that. Well, that's fascinating. Especially being a compilation film, right? There are five short films within the film, so it's easy to, to break it up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and what, what's interesting too is that in your, in your, if I remember this correctly, what starts your interest in this particular subject matter for this project are actually films from Nollywood. Right, so sort of the unexpected encounter with queer characters. Um, so tell us a little bit about the industry in Nigeria as well as how that industry, I guess, approaches queer representation. Yeah, so you did a great job in your intro breaking down. And I think uh, the African cinema, and that's why this, it's cinemas rather than cinema right. in the title. But uh, for those who aren't familiar with African cinema as a, as a field of study, and that's where, I, I mean, I was, I trained in that. I was doing a lot of that for my dissertation. 
I think one of the things that is um, is really interesting and, and you kind of need to understand is that there's a lot of different types of film traditions. Um, the Ken Kenyan's pretty new, um, but there's this, Frank there's this whole Francophone art film tradition um, that comes out of the 1960s. There's a film festival every other year in Burkina Faso. Um, a lot of the filmmakers trained in France or they trained in, in, in Russia. So there's you know this def definitely the sort of Marxist tendency and there are a lot of times social, you know, social issue films uh, tied to in, in some ways the French new wave. And so there's this whole Francophone art film tradition. Uh, for when I was in graduate school, that's what I studied. I took an African mm -hmm. cinema class and it was, that's what we studied were these francophone art films they're great they're really beautiful films too um and then what happens in, and then you have the the anglophone video tradition which starts late 80s early 1990s and it's totally different it's a totally different origin uh i know we only have an hour so i can't give a whole <laughs> <laughs> no but this whole, is fascinating a, a keep whole, going um yeah. a spiel on it but the gist is um, it's a it's a time of 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 a lot of economic uncertainty, uh, and state TV is laying off a lot of people, and it's also a time when technology is becoming a lot cheaper. So you've got mm. VCRs. Brian Larkin writes about the infrastructures of piracy, and I probably most people, many people are familiar with Nollywood through Larkin's um, work. So you have you know VCRs, you have d distributions of uh, what he calls like. Uh, was it? infrastructures of piracy where you have got these whole these distribution centers set up in markets where they're dubbing VCRs. so you've got a lot of equipment a lot of technology and then you also have a lot of unemployed um, state television actors um, people with know-how um, technical know-how and it's actually in Ghana it started a little bit earlier but you know more or less very, very similar in Nigerian Ghana very similar traditions where you have people just picking up a, a video camera and making films and then that film getting um basically <laughs> the what I, I mean, we didn't call it going viral then but like basically <laughs> going the whatever the hard copy version of going viral is uh where people would copy it and distribute it and you had a really really popular local film industry they were melodramas for the most part um, a lot of the earlier ones had these uh, kind of occult subplots. Oh yeah, uh, right. And um, they're fun, and they're you know, and they're just they they're not at all trying to be world cinema or global cinema at all. Mm -hmm. They do not, you know, they that is not their aspiration. They want to just make pe make films that other you know that that Nigerians and Ghanaians want to see, and they're really successful at doing that. Um, so you have what they call the video boom. And then, you know, they move from, it was started on VHS and then um, uh, VCDs and DVDs. And now, you know, like everything else, it's, it's uploaded and, and streamed. But because that's a really different type of film industry than like a Frank, than an art cinema, what you have are popular stories and, um, and, 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 and popular stories that talk about everyday concerns and moral issues, right? Um, Karen Barber's work on African popular culture is really informative uh, here where she talks about um, thinking about, and she's not writing in particular about video films, but she's writing about uh, like the Yoruba theater tradition, but, um, but whatever popular form you're talking about, they're things that speak to local audiences, right? Things that, that, are, that, are, that hit a nerve, that are, that are pressing, that are concerning. And so I really just, by chance, wound up discovering some of these Ghanaian and Nigerian films that had queer characters. I wasn't looking for them. My first book is on car culture in West Africa, looking at, um, again, I mean, it's still films, looking mostly at films and, and novels um, and, and plays. It was, a, you know, a film oriented project. So I was, that's why I was watching so many of these films and interviewing filmmakers. But I found these films and I was like, what? I didn't know what to do with them they are real they're cautionary tales so when i say they can they speak to to popular concerns they speak to anxieties about homosexuality so these are not you know these are not what we would think of uh, as films that circulate <laughs> in your these are not the life-saving films <laughs> right. right they're films that um, that really that condemn homosexuality that speak to the anxieties about these types of transgressions and so 
I kind of discovered one and then another and I was like okay and I, I tried to see if people were writing about this academically and I, I didn't find very you know very much out there and I it took me a while to kind of figure out how to um, to write about these films and also how to write about them in a non-dismissive way right because mm -hmm. I I was in my in my in my in my first book writing about interestingly enough writing about in a, in a pretty positive light how some of these Nigerian films were really like Kind of condemning hypercapitalism, right? Oh. And how they were speaking to these moral anxieties about uh, these anxieties about moral transgressions of the nouveau riche. I wouldn't call them <laughs> anti-capitalist films by any means, but um, but I, I wanted to I wanted to think about how to write about these films uh, in a non-dismissive way, and really think about what they were doing. And so that's where this the project really started was writing about some, the, the film Jezebel, which is from, from um, Ghana, and then some of the Nigerian films. And uh, I went to Nigeria in 2010 um, with a friend, uh, or co-researcher co friend, uh, Unoma Azua, who's a Nigerian, and she had written a newspaper article about these films, and I happened to meet her at a conference. Uh, and so we um, we kind of teamed up to write this this article in 2010. I don't think it was, I think it was published in 2012. And I kind of thought that that was, okay, it's like, okay, well, I'm writing this article. That's kind of my side article while I'm putting the first book down. And then, you know, more and more films kept coming up. But so, yeah, they started, it started, the, the, the book started in a really different way, not with the stories of our lives and Rafiki type films. You know, that's so fascinating, um, Lindsay. So essentially they're, you were trying to figure out a way to talk about films that were all about enforcing a social order and right. really kind of policing the imaginary. Um, yep. And I wonder, you know, it almost reminds me of the early feminist analyses of, of melodramas where right. there was this uh, call to ignore the endings because that's where the right. punishment happened. Yep. <laughs> and, and this work that was done actually interviewing women for, who were, you know, young in the 40s and who reported that that was exactly what they did. In fact, in many mm. cases, didn't even remember that right. the, what the ending was. So yeah. just remember the celebratory prelude to the right. punishment. Yeah. So that's fascinating to hear you talk about this going on in this different, different sphere and different time. Yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, it it's analogous in some ways and not in other ways, um, sure. it, because I think that um, the from from the conversations that I've had with queer people, and I did a, I did a, a little audience study and it was very selective and probably, um, you know, biased in many ways, but I, you know, watched some of these Nollywood films with queer audiences and I talked to queer people and, you know, they were just so shaken by them in some ways, um, they felt that they were really dangerous to their, uh -huh. to their well-being. Yeah. On the other hand, um, you know, there's, there's a scholar, Noah Tsika, who writes about um, the ways that some of these films have like these online lives that are totally different. Mm -hmm. Um, especially like, you mean like excerpted or things yeah, like that? Yeah, so people will just take the like the sexy parts and post it right. online, and then it, it doesn't become a film about punishing the gay the the gay uh -huh. person, right? It becomes a totally you know totally different, and so you know so so th that happens, and it also it doesn't happen. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a very similar idea where there's definitely ways to read against the grain, um, for sure. Yeah, and that yeah, almost harkens. Though. Yeah, go on, Bruno. No, I was just gonna say those remixes, right? That that surface online, are perhaps are evidence of the forms of resistance that you're finding Absolutely. in these films, right? That you're yeah. sort of highlighting as, in the absence of of what we might call queer forward representations, those yeah. those you know, uh, right? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like conservative representations, for lack of a better yeah. or homophobic representations of queerness, yeah, um, are the entry point, right? Yeah, for queer pleasure. Well, yeah, and and also just just to mark queer existence because this is also yeah. Nigeria is also a country that says queer people don't exist here. Like it's just it's it that's not that doesn't happen here. They also say we have to legislate against it at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Make sure like, it doesn't <laughs> appear. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but they're also kind of just denying the fact that it exists. So right, and so to have these films that show that show that it does, and sometimes showing you know, showing that it's, you know, showing for, for moments, you know, actually like really nice, healthy relationships. And um, they don't get to say that way, but, uh, but, but they do, there are, there are some moments where it's like, okay, well, this is a country that like, even just acknowledging that one can have a, 
a relationship or that, you know, that, um, you know, a couple, there's a film which one of the characters, you know, makes this biological argument, right? You know, this born this way argument, which to, to be a popular film making that argument um, is, is something. So it's so interesting to hear you talk about, you know, almost these audiences of resistance and audiences of complicity and how they're parsing these works. It's really fascinating. Um, and then, you know, in speaking of Nigeria um, and sort of this, this uh, <laughs> policing of representation um, that exists there, um, that's also the place where tears come from, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and so, so how is that possible? And what, what is the work that TIERS is doing? I, I have it, it's, it stands for the Initiative for Equal Rights. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an organization, a Lagos-based um, organization. They call it a human rights organization, um, but it's, it's very LGBT focused. They started making films that used Nollywood aesthetics and Nollywood actors, Nollywood mm -hmm. directors, uh, but were, had a totally different message. So rather than condemning the queer characters, they're condemning, they're condemning the homophobic characters. And they started making these films, they're, they're, really, they're really subtle. Uh, and, you know, it's, I write about how like we, and I've show, I tried to show them to, to my students and my students, before the backstory, they're like, why are we even watching this? Like, it's not particularly radical or interesting, but the films are, are made to, again, like Nollywood films, they're not made for global audiences. They're made to be shown to local audiences. They're made to be conversation starters. Uh, they're, they're um, you know, the, the point is to have, you know, premieres with A-list actors at them and to have blogs about them and to have talk show people talking about them. And they're, they're, they're films that are, I mean, they're, they're radical in some ways. And then, and also they're just, they're, they're kind of subtle. They're, they're films that, that look at the consequence, like that, that kind of like make the homophobic characters seem like the ones that are immoral or wrong. And they, they do, it's, it's, it's amazing work. Um, I talk about them that this as a practice of negotiation as a form, as, as one of the forms of resistance that I, that I look at and, um, and quiet and some of the characters, some of the, the films, um, one's called We Don't Live Here Anymore actually barely focuses on, it's two high school boys and we, and we barely focus on the boys. It's really about their mothers and their, their mother's reactions and the the filmmaker and the and the writer both said that that's that was what they were trying to do like that's their target audience were like this was at a time made at a time right after the same sex marriage prohibition act was passed in 2014 uh and there were you heard you heard lot you heard stories of of um like vigilante justice and public beatings and people being dragged out of their house and and beaten in public and the police supporting the people that are doing the beating rather than the, the, the victims. And so, um, so the filmmaker and the writer basically said, you know, this was, this was a film to address that moral crisis, right? To address, rather than the moral crisis of, of the moral crisis of homosexuality, right? But this was a film that they wanted people to say like, okay, what would you do if it was your brother or your son that was being dragged out of the house? Where, where do you stand in that? And I think that that's really powerful and it did, it did a lot of important work. And so that's the, the initiative for equal rights is doing that kind of work, but they're still using, but they're still like, they're still melodrama films. They're still using, you know, um, beautiful costumes and actors and lighting and right. They're, they're making it appeal to popular audience to, to local audiences as well. And they're winning awards at, um, these films are also winning awards at like best of Nollywood, like film, like, um, Wow. award competitions in Nigeria. Um, so that, I think that's really interesting too. And how are they allowed to circulate? <laughs> they're not. <laughs> I okay. mean, they are and they're not. So um, each, each one has a little bit of a different story. Ironically, um, the Nigerian censors board isn't as strict as the Kenyan censors board. So even though the laws against homosexuality in Nigeria are very harsh and very strict, um, the censors aren't quite as um, as draconian, and so you so I mean there there's a lot of it basically. So the 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 films are the first film they made was called Hell or High Water, and they just put that up online. And the Nigerian censors don't really mess with you when you're just putting stuff up online. They also consider private like film festivals or premieres. They consider those private events. 
And they also just, they don't really mess with those. So you can have a premiere, you can have a private event. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard any stories of those being people being, you know, raided or, or harassed. Whereas the, whereas in Kenya, you know, you've got to get permit to film, you've got to have police on set, you've got it right. And so the, the government is kind of in your face the whole, the whole way through. And so that's what, that's where stories of, of your lives was kind of, the, the, that's what, that will, that's what was used to call out them, which was like, well, you didn't have a, you know, a permit to shoot. So in Nigeria, the, the rules, and because they have this huge film industry and there's so many films, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands, there's, there's a little bit, there's just a little bit more room to breathe, I guess. So on the one hand, you know, if you make a film and put it up online, the, the sensors don't have anything to do with that. You show it at a, uh, an event, the sensors don't have anything to do with it. Where the sensors do um, is if you want to, if it wants to, have, if you want to have a theatrical release. Mm. And so the film, We Don't Live Here Anymore was the first film that Tears wanted to have a theatrical release. And that got a little bit tricky and it didn't really work out. So, um, but they did wind up, uh, it's on Amazon, I, I think it's still there on Amazon Prime. So they, they wound up streaming it there. And, and again, I mean, it can show at private events and also uh, part, of, part of what they wanted to do is just create the, and they, they have public relations people too, like create the buzz around the film. So that film mm -hmm. won, I can't remember, but like, I'm gonna say around 10 different awards at the best of Nollywood. So it was also a film that was just written about and talked about so even if people weren't seeing it, they were hearing about it. And that was also important too. So yeah, it's just each country has a different set of regulations and rules and it doesn't always line up to how you think it's gonna be. Right. This is so fascinating because in a way, I think your study is also a challenge to cinema studies as a discipline, which I think tends to focus so much on the globalized films, the right. films that travel, the films that we here in the in the vaunted United States get access to. Right. And, you know, the, I think there's, as a result, a lot of lacunae, a lot of ignorance, a lot of misinterpretation, you know, based on that. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. There was a, um, a film that came out recently called Ife, um, a Nigerian film. It's a short film. And, um, and I had written a review on it. And um, actually, before I wrote a review on it, I was, I was, Doing some, I was looking at the way that it was it was published. I know the I know the filmmaker. Um, that's how I got to see the film, and I knew that like I, like her strategy was like this is this is going to be it's a thirty minute film. We're gonna um, it's called the Equality Hub. Uh, it's an, another organization that partners with Tears. Um, they actually created their own website, and they're like we're having it on our website, and you can pay you can rent it on our website. So they are trying to get some profit. It's an interesting strategy. Um, and you know we'll have our own premiere, but they weren't trying for a theatrical release at all, which is so they didn't really need the censors. And then you have CNN, this CNN article. I think it's CNN. It might be BBC. Um, basically writing this article like the censors are blocking Ife, and I was like, <laughs> that's not what happened at all. Like no, <laughs> um, right? And I was like, so I I I asked her before I wrote this. I was like, Pamela, I'm reading about this this. Um, you know, beef that you have with the censors board, but that's not what happened, right? She's like, no, I don't know what happened. Like CNN called up the censors board and the censors board were like, we're censoring this. But she's like, but I didn't, I wasn't trying to show it in the theaters. And so it became this, it was, you know, it was like this perfect example, it became this headline is like, well, this is how you should read a queer Nigerian film as, right? And they were, and it, it came out after Rafiki. And so I think they were just trying to be like, okay, well, this is another Rafiki. But it wasn't. It, something different was happening, um, and something specific was happening, and um, and so I think that a lot of those things get yeah uh, that 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 you you need a lot of a lot of um, background and local knowledge I think to sort of parse this stuff out and you know we don't we don't all have that right yeah. I came as I said I came at this from being in African cinema studies and studying African popular culture and having that. Um, set of critical tools when, when I went into it. And that's what I it was almost, I mean, I'm glad Rafiki came out. I'm glad Stories of Our Lives came out. I love writing about those films, but I kind of came at it at first from thinking about the popular culture films. Yeah, well, your book is a great corrective to that kind of flattening that happens from Thank the perspective you. here. If I can jump in, Bruno, this, I apologize yeah. if this was your next question, but um, I really wanted to get Lindsay to talk about this, her concept of the Afro-queer um, fugitivity 
And um, I want to make sure we didn't run out of time for that as we start getting questions now. So could you talk a bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, so to, so to transition like our previous yeah, discussion. Sorry, about I jumped discussion, you right, right somewhere no, no, else. <laughs> no, no, um, but one of, the, one of the challenges of this project was to take these different archives and figure out how to have something that was coherent, right? Um, and not just a series of essays. And, and, and so I was thinking about different types of resistance and, and so the negotiation or these quieter modes or, um, you know, and there's quiet moments, moments in, in Rafiki as well. Um, and to think about different types of resistance and, the, and, and thinking about resistance and confinement and complicity and how in each of these types of films, there, there seems to be this tension between um, between being blocked, between being trapped, and between wanting to escape. Um, so no matter what the tradition that the film is in, um, you know, there's the, there's there's this tension, right? Uh, right. Even a, a, a really progressive film um, like The Wound, a South African film, which is a beautiful film and really shows um, Krinas in existing in these indigenous spaces. Um, okay, plug your ears if you don't like spoilers. Um, <laughs> it ends with one of the queer characters being killed off. Um, and so it has an ending that winds up being similar to the Nollywood films, even though its its purpose is totally different. So, so I was trying to think about ways to articulate in the introduction, right? As one does in an introduction, <laughs> one tries to say, well, this is why these chapters actually go together. And um, and one of the concepts that that was really interesting to me, which which really comes more from um, from African American studies, was this concept of fugitivity. Um, this idea of fleeing, this, this um, Francesca Royster who writes about um, queer sound and, and eccentricity has a really good definition. Um, she talks about the, the fugitive impulse um, as, as the impulse to, um, to flee the objectification um, and social death of slavery, but also to, to remember that it's embodied lessons and to remember its constraints. And so I was thinking about, that was one of the, I was reading her work as I was working on the film Carmen Carmen Gay, um, which was also one of the earlier films that right. I that I wrote about and thought about, um, and to think about again. So it's this this fugitivity being this impulse to to flee and also to to kind of remembering this remembering and uh, the, the the embodiment of, of of entrapment. So this entanglement of escape and confinement. Um, and I'm not the only scholar, other, other scholars, Matthew Omelsky is, is, is one who is, work, is thinking about how this also applies um, in the African context as well, thinking about, you know, not just um, black life in the US, but black global life. And so it was thinking about that and, and, and also thinking about, um, and Tavi Nyong'o also writes about fugitivity, Kugara Mashara writes about uh, fugitivity, and so I was thinking about fugitivity and it's, and it's also, it's, it's, it's queerness, um, kind of a la, a la Munoz, this, this, this hope, um, this queer futurity, um, this, this desire to kind of escape that which isn't enough, right? Um, and so this is a, this is a, a long-winded answer, of course, um, but, but to think about Afroqueer fugitivity is to think about a particular, particularly African and particularly queer um, type of escape, um, a, a, a will towards towards fleeing. And it can take a lot of different forms, right? And so, I mean, it could be running away, like literally like running away, running to a, a better space, but it could be um, in, uh, like in Rafiki, Kenna and Ziki on the rooftop, you know, making a promise um, about a future life, mm -hmm. you know, that will never be like them down there, that will be something real. Um, and, and, uh, and it could be, and sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's, um, it's more, it's more supernatural. Sometimes it's, you know, shape-shifting and there's, you know, there's other moments. Um, so I don't try to limit it. So I, I, I think about these moments of escape, but then also ways in which they're oftentimes cut off and they're oftentimes blocked. And so it's this, you know, again, an entanglement, I think of, of escape and confinement. It's great. The introduction, by the way, gives a great illustration of that um, as you read through the final segment of Stories of Our Lives. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah, everybody has access to that, I think, through, through our page. So I yeah, probably yeah. recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind people who are here that we have um, about um, a little more than uh, a little less than 15 minutes left. So if you have any questions you want addressed or any topics you want Lindsay and Bruno talking about, 
just post um, a note in either uh, the Q&A or the chat and we'll get to it as we, because otherwise we're going to just keep going. This is fascinating. Bruno, back over to you, sorry. I wanted to ask Lindsay about her, her research process, specifically your field work in, mm -hmm. uh, in Africa. Um, I know that you've mentioned, I think in our interview that there were some uncomfortable conversations to have with particular filmmakers, as well as the anecdote of going to a film festival in Uganda. So tell us the highlights of that, as well as the challenges in doing that kind of work. <clears throat> yeah, there, there was a, there was there was only one uncomfortable interview um, that, that I can <laughs> remember actually, which is which is which is you know, um, and that's when I was working on some of these earlier Nollywood films that I said are mm. are made as. Oh, I'm sorry, too uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> We'll hear both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's not much. I mean, it's just it's it's hard to 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 sit there and have a, a person kind of seriously tell you, you know, why you know lesbianism is destroying the country, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what do you, what do you do um, in that? Or um, uh, what was the phrase? One and I, it's quoted in in the uh, one of the articles that I wrote. Uh, but a filmmaker basically said, like, it's it's. To allow somebody to be gay is denying them their human right, because mm. I think the logic was like it's it's terrible to allow somebody to do this, right? Like you're you're, but it, it was yeah, it, it was it was yeah. So there were there were a couple moments um, where you just kind of had to to sit there, and I was like, I'm not here to like I'm interviewing. I'm actually interested to hear what you say, and I'm not we're not gonna start a debate here because that's, there's only one way it's gonna end, right? Like, um, and so, yeah, there were a couple moments like that, but for the most part, um, for the most part, uh, I was I was speaking with um, with filmmakers, with audiences. Um, I mean, even the, even I sat with the, Unomozu and I sat with the, the censors in Nigeria, um, in a, up in Abuja, and we, <laughs> We had a blast. Um, they were really lovely people. They um, they bought us Fanta orange soda and, and grilled meat, and we sat and watched some movies. And they told us about what they censored and what they didn't. Um, so um, so yeah. So the, there there were only a couple like uncomfortable moments. Um, the <clears throat> the film festival in Uganda, I think that you're referring to, um, Bruno. That was that was the hardest. Uh, that was the hardest part of my 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 research. Um, it was, um, I had been to the, the, it was the second time I had been to the Kampala, Queer Kampala Film Festival. Um, the first time it was, um, it was a little bit more makeshift. And then the, the second year, um, and, I, and I write about, about that in, the, in, in, in chapter four, but the second year they had this really cool space. They built the screen. Um, I was at the opening night, there was dancing. I was chatting with people that I had met the year before. Like there was just this really like festive atmosphere. Um, there was a really cool project there called the um, Human Rights Tattoo. And basically like this organization like tattoos one letter on people's arm and it's the, what is it? Uh, I'm gonna mingle it. Like it's a declaration of human rights. Is that what the document is called? Um, and so they photograph people's arms. And so there are people like getting tattooed, like letters tattooed. The first time in my life, I almost considered getting a tattoo. But then, and I might have, I really might have. But then the, the second day, um, I was I was actually on my way to the festival and I got a message saying, hey, stay, stay at your hotel, stay tight. The police have raided. Um, and luckily they got, the organizers got tipped off early. And so they were able to pack up the equipment and um, it was just the tattoo people that were there so the which did there mm. you're allowed to tattoo people um, so um, so they, they kind of packed up and they went into hiding but um, uh, and then it was I think it was the next day that I that I sat and met with the organizer I've just like I've just never seen a person so crushed um, and they all were, they put so much time, so much effort into putting this festival together. You know, that, that opening night was great. It was like, we nailed it. We got it. Um, and they, you know, they didn't know who informed. They, they suspected, I, I could never confirm this, but they suspected it was somebody inside the community that, that informed the police. You know, maybe that, maybe that is the case and maybe it isn't, but, um, but it, it was hard as a, as a researcher to just sit there and be like, sad with somebody and upset and you know see see this work go to waste and to 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 you know yeah just just kind of it was just it was just devastating 
You know, I think we don't hear these stories enough in the United States because, um, you know, uh, three years ago, I attended a, a queer film festival in St. Petersburg. And it was a similar kind of situation where they had uh, contracted with a local theater. They were having a big opening night and then um, political thugs showed up, blocked the entrance, um, called in, they called in a fake report to the police that there were hostages being held inside oh the God, theater. God. So the whole place was, you know, descended on by SWAT teams and mm -hmm. the theater owner canceled their contract. Mm -hmm. And it, overnight they found a community space, mm -hmm. they reset up and it proceeded <clears> wonderfully. <throat> but interestingly, the one other bomb threat that was made to them came to prevent the showing of Rafiki. So I'm circling mm -hmm. this back wow. to you. And yeah. um, it was very, it was kind of jubilant that they found this other space, but then it was also heartbreaking. Yeah. And now the people, things have deteriorated so much that people who organized it have now had to leave Russia. Yeah. So wow. these situations, I think we don't hear about enough, but given, given the United States today and the Supreme Court, we might want to do, mm -hmm. we might want to advise everyone to read your book and to start learning more about what's going on locally in a lot of these yeah. countries and parts of the world. Anyway, I jumped in with that, but I just want to refer to the chat since we invited it, um, that Wima Muma, who is um, a Kenyan graduate student at Warwick, had posted thanking you um, for the link and for to, wanting to watch Ife and saying that um, they had to design their own module and that your article has been really helpful for the research. Great. So I just wanted to call your attention to that. Great, one. great. I'm glad. And I want to add something to what you said too, Ruby, that I think in some ways we do hear these stories, um, but we hear them in really different ways. We hear them as these kind of sensationalist stories, like we'll hear the headline, like, you know, what a queer film festival shut down in St. Petersburg. But I think what we don't hear um, is, and, and this is this is why we love, this is, you know, I think many of us here are film scholars or literary scholars. This is what we, I think, why we do what we do. but. What we don't hear is is how that impacts people, like that mm -hmm. the, the the effective reaction, right? Like, I mean, so you could say, okay, you know, Ro Roe v. Wade was overturned, um, and we hear about it in the in the news, but like how, like the stories that we aren't, we don't, we're not telling is like how I almost threw up when I heard that, or how I'm texting my, you know, my mom and my sister, and everybody's crying, and like these kind of emotive reactions, and and these kind of snapshots, um, and, and that's what for me, like being at the festivals and having these conversations, I, that was really, it was just a different way of thinking through these things and a, mm -hmm. and a way in which, you know, our scholarly work, I think, gets at it in a way that, that sort of the, the news cycles don't, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a great question. Yeah. Another one in, in, in the Q&A from Usha Iyer saying, I'd love to hear how your book has been received in Africa, in different areas of Africa, obviously, if it has, and in the academy, as well as in the popular press. And also a second question, um, how does your own positionality come into play in your field work, interviews, and the reception of your work? Are you read as an outsider or, um, you know, mm -hmm. how, how are you seen there? So just a set of yeah. questions that are really interesting. Yeah, those are, those are great. Um, so the the book has only been out for a few months so i'm not sure that it's it's how much to what extent it's circulated i um i do hope to do some events at african universities and zoom allows us to do that so um i guess i guess stay tuned for that um i mean i've given some talks um for uh from from parts of that in in south africa um but that was mostly to an academic audience that I think is in many ways pretty similar to, to the academic audiences in the US with the exception that they're in South Africa. So I don't, I don't know if the, the reception was, was any different. Obviously the, the Q and A and the insights were, were, were interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I do hope that the book circulates um, uh, in, in that sense. And, I, and, and actually, um, so the, you know, Duke made the introduction available um, online and then also, um, I recently received word that uh, I got an NEH grant for open publication. Um, so I don't Wonderful. know. Yeah, Wonderful. I'm really, Congratulations. I mean, that was, that was, I've never been more excited about uh, <laughs> an award in my, in my life, okay. because it, it's so, I mean, to go back to your first question, Bruno, um, 
uh, about, you know, it being dedicated to, you know, um, so it, I, I don't know the timeline for that. I don't have any information. It's not going to mm -hmm. be right away, but eventually it'll be open access. And so I think a lot of African scholars will be able to access it that way. I mean, right now it's, it's hard because it's a book that's, I think, $30. Um, so, but the other question about my own positionality, I think is a really important one and, um, and something that I think a lot about. I mean, I'm, I, I'm a queer white Jewish woman um, who goes, you know, who's, who's doing these, these interviews. Um, and so am I seen as an outsider, of course, um, you know, by, by virtue of the color of my skin. Um, and, I, and I understand that I'm also not a, I mean, I'm not an activist, I'm not a filmmaker, um, but, but what I, in terms of my my field my my field work, what I'm what I'm interested in besides finding out these backstories, is actually having conversations with people, and um, I wind up having a lot of conversations with people who, like me, like to watch queer films, <laughs> and so um, and so I, I I felt like I had a lot of conversations with people, you know, about what we like to watch, um, and and um, you know, the film Moonlight came out in, in twenty sixteen. 2016? <laughs> a while was ago, that, maybe. Was that 2016? Yeah. Am I, Could be. Uh, around, yeah. around then? Around um, So uh, I felt like when I was in Nigeria doing some of these, I, I had so many conversations. And it's a film that I love and a film that I teach. Um, and so I wound up having a lot of conversations about Moonlight. And, and, so, and, and if I'm talking to a filmmaker, then we're talking about some of the, um, some of the cinematic techniques, right? Um, and some of the scenes and the way they're shot. Um, and those are interesting conversations. And so... I feel like I'm, I'm always able, I'm obviously an outsider, um, but I'm, I, I always felt that I was having, you know, with the exceptions of a couple, the couple conversations I mentioned before, but I always felt like I was having conversations with new friends about things like, you know, when you meet somebody new and you're like, oh, we like the same film, <laughs> which all, often to me doesn't happen in the U.S. Because if I'm trying to talk about the films that I'm watching in the U.S., I really don't have anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I could talk about these films too, but um, but yeah. So I I I think um, I was very aware that I'm a listener and that I'm a learner. Um, that I I'm, I'm trying to uh, understand the the local context rather than to map my own um, needs or projections or things um, that I want the films to be and the want the films to do. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot about just kind of having conversations and, and learning and listening and realizing, uh, realizing where my blind spots were. Um, mm -hmm. So. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, just to say, just to remind people that um, the page views column and with the conversation and the interview that you and Bruno did is online on the film quarterly website along with the PDF for your introduction that Duke allowed us to post there. Uh, so that's both open. We have two more questions coming up. And since we're short on time, I want to give you both of these. First from L. Miller, I'm curious to know if you've seen Neptune Frost yet. And uh, if so, uh, what you think about the Afrofuturist surrealist trans character. I, I haven't, I, I really want we're to. We're waiting I, it to was, see it, right? <laughs> uh, it was playing at a film, film festival here for one night and I was out of town. So ah. um, I, I hope to get to see it, but I haven't. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then um, a wonderful comment from James Williams who's on our editorial board um, saying that he's really enjoying this conversation, congratulating you on the book, um, that he loves the range and plurality and your commitment to precisely what you've just been talking about to not yourself be defined in queer African cinema. And he wonders if you could talk a little more about resistance. Uh, Bruno, he says, Bruno puts this in parallel with pleasure. Would that also include the pleasures of critical resistance, reading against the grain, um, which is narrative cinema defined by storytelling and characterization? So that's a wonderful uh, question, James. Thank you, and uh, throw it, toss it over to you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, resistance. The the way that I think about resistance in 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 this book is to also um, to also pluralize it um, and to think about it not just in terms of um, you know. Uh, mapping my own concepts of what a resistant film needs to be, but kind of looking for, um, you know, to go back to my answer to the previous question, uh, listening for, for quieter modes of resistance, um, things that might, um, might kind of be below the threshold in some ways, right? Uh, so I, I think about pleasure, I think about, um, I think about the, the kiss, 
I think about the touch, I think about the text, um, text meaning like text message, um, <laughs> uh, also the text. Um, I think about um, what it means to run away or what it means to flourish or what it means to have a film festival and have it get raided by the police um, and then, you know, show it, a, show, show, show the films in a private residence, you know, um, those are imperfect forms of resistance, right? Um, you didn't get your big public film festival, but you still gathered a bunch of friends and watched the film together. Um, so I want to think about resistance, and I, I, I need to, in order for the book to, to congeal, I think, um, to think about all the different types of resistance, and, and sometimes those are small moments, and they absolutely include pleasure, they absolutely include reading against the grain, um, in, you know, I'm trying to think about them, not just in terms of, you know, big grand gestures or um, films that kind of make a, make a big splash or, you know, make a mark, but sometimes films that are really quietly resistant and so that they don't get blocked by the censors. Um, so like, you know, that they're kind of negotiating. Um, and, and that's, that's one of the, the, I think the things, the, the, con the resistance is the concept for me that ties all the different chapters together. Um, and in order to do that, I really had to um, play with and unpack how I was thinking about resistance and also to think about resistance, um, just drawing on, on work of, of other critical theories, uh, theorists, Judith Butler, but to think about um, resistance um, as, as drawing from vulnerability and not being um, something that you you know, not 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 vulnerability and weaknesses is something that you overcome, but something that's often kind of entangled with resistance. Well, I think that's a great place to end. We've gone a little bit over time, but it's this has been just so enjoyable. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Bruno, for the great questions and summary. And uh, it's really been terrific. And uh, go out and buy the book, everyone <laughs> thank out you. there. Okay, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks. Bye bye.